All right, me and TJ are heading back out. It's actually about a year since we cruised out here to initially place amateur jade hair. And it's been that long. I think so, yeah. Um, in my backpack is the antenna we're gonna replace the old antenna with. If you remember, you've seen the pictures, that old antenna was about as tall as I am. It's a uh, 13 dBi sector. And I put that in because I didn't know what I was doing. But uh, I do now and it's gonna get replaced with the three DBI H antenna that's in my backpack. So this is the view we got. Pretty radical morning here in San Diego. I'll uh, yeah, let you know how it goes when we get up there. All right, so that is the one year on beginning of the journey with amateur Jade Hair. It actually took a couple trips to get out there. If you're a noticer, you'll notice that my t-shirt color in the first video is different than the second video. Those were a couple days apart as I realized I'd forgotten some tools um, and, and didn't, you know, missing some important parts on the first time. So what I wanted to shoot this for was to kind of connect with you and let you know what's happening next with Gristle King and why it might be important for you is I've been doing this helium thing for a little bit over a year. I've deployed a bunch of hotspots. I started with one on my house. I put one, I put ones on commercial buildings. Obviously I've put one on mountains. I put them on grid, off grid, all kinds of different flavors. As I did more and more of them and as I wrote the Gristle King blog, people started finding me. I, I wrote the thing initially just so family and friends could know what I was doing, you know, 25 hours a day from let's say September to February, September 2020 to, to February 2021. Um, when I came up for air and decided like, wow, maybe I should do more than just put all of my available time into helium. But as that happened, as the blog kind of grew and people started reading it, they're reaching out to me and asking for consults. And so I started doing consultations. You know, it started off uh, super funny. I got a, you know, I used to have my cell phone number on the, on the website. And so I get calls all the time. I got this great call nine o'clock in the evening. I was sitting right outside of my truck, phone rings. I pick it up and it's this dude with this heavy uh, Russian accent or Ukrainian accent. You know, hello, I live in Buffalo, New York. I have a fleet of hotspots to deploy. I want you to help me. And it was just like, those are the kinds of phone calls that I think anyone would like getting. It's like this kind of spy thriller thing, but it's all obviously totally above board. Um, but it became this thing where I said, okay, I can't take an hour and a half long phone call at night you know, at nine o'clock at night when I'm supposed to be eating dinner or doing kind of the rest of my regular life or whatever. So I built a consulting business where I said, hey, I'll put up blocks of my time. You can pay me for that time. We'll go through your situation together, whatever it is, whether you're deploying one hot spot on your house in Oregon and you're this like super cool family that I got to talk to, or you're that guy in Buffalo, you know, thinking about buying a thousand hot spots to deploy a giant fleet of them, or you're the dude in New York who wanted to, or actually had already bought 5,000 hot spots and just wanted to run their strategies and ideas by me before they kind of went full hog with it. So they, they had their whole team. Um, and that's that's kind of the gamut that I've seen is like the little mom and pop thing where it's a, a small family or one person all the way out to giant fleet deployments. So I ended up taking all of that knowledge and putting it into, and I noticed over time that the consults got to be, eh, right, like 60 minutes, 90 minutes, something like that. That was the amount of time, A, that people can pay attention, and B, that, that I need to take all of the information that is important about the helium ecosystem and put it into basically into your head so that you can efficiently take about a year's worth of information that I've learned from deploying all of these hotspots and helping people deploy thousands of their hotspots and make it so it's useful for you. And that's what I did. And just to give you a, a super brief idea, um, when I started, I was in the bigger is better antenna camp. So we went from basically, I'll kind of skip all of the, all the uh, intermediate parts here is like one of the very first antennas that I put up. So this is a 13 DBI sector antenna. It weighs about 32 pounds. Um, it is a super directional, super focused antenna, and I thought that was really important. And then I went through a bunch of other antennas, small ones like this, finished up with this guy right here, which as you probably know is the H antenna. That's all I put on my deployments right now. Um, this isn't about antennas. This is about the journey through helium. And as we learn more and we understand more, we do better and better jobs, right? So You've heard me say before, the antennas don't really matter. It's a fun thing to fiddle with, but that's just an idea like, hey, when you start, you don't really know what you're doing, so you go for what you think is the right thing. But as you go through a system, as you learn more and more about any ecosystem, any environment, as you become better and better able to interact with it, and yeah, do a better job within it. So that's just one example of how my thinking has progressed and how my understanding has deepened of the, of the Helium network. And so what I wanted to do was to take these hour, hour and a half long consulting sessions that were custom to someone, and make a pretty standard thing. So I noticed the, the same thing happened over and over and over. The people had the same questions, they had the same misunderstandings, they had the same kind of gaps of understanding that I could fill in this time period. And so what I've done is I've recorded this 
that's I think it's 50 some minutes just under an hour of the standard kind of flow for a consultation session so it's not a personalized thing to you it's not going to address specifically your situation you know the fact that you've got a whatever four inch fashion on a 29 inch whatever roof and blah 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 like that stuff you're gonna have to figure out on your own but most of the big lifting is done for you in this session and that's that's why I recorded it so Super excited about putting that thing out there. Um, I'll show you a little bit more about the Amateur Jade install. Uh, sorry, Amateur Jade hair install. You can look at that online and see the uh, earnings have gone up and down over time. You can see where there have been mistakes that have been made. You can see where there have been network impacts. You can see where it was doing super well and, and times where it hasn't done as well. And those are all a part of being inside the helium ecosystem. Um, I'll finish up by saying, by kind of telling a, a story that I've wanted to tell for a long time and something I think is uh, super cool. And it's not really related to helium, but I'm putting it in here because, because it is. So many, many years ago, Lee, my wife and I went down to, um, down to Uruguay so I could learn Spanish. We went down for three months and got 2020, something like that. Summer of 2021, maybe, or sorry, no, summer of 2001. Uh, went down to Uruguay, spent the three months there learning Spanish, finished it up and had a couple weeks left. And we said, oh, we'll go down to Argentina. And we'll check out all the places. We'll go to Buenos Aires. We'll go down to Tierra del Fuego, El Calafate, like check out the tourist stuff. So we did. And the very first step of that was getting on this ferry that goes from the Uruguay side over to the Argentine side. You're crossing the, the Rio de la Plata, the, the Silver River, River of Silver. So we get on this ferry and there's, I don't know, a couple hundred people on there. At the time, I was uh, super watchful, super kind of uh, maybe not paranoid, suspicious, but always like checking everyone out. Um, I just come off a job that required that. And I noticed uh, out of many people, there's this one dude who looked like a dumpy kind of Midwestern guy. Um, you know, I just catalog him like, okay, dude's probably not a threat. I talked to him a little bit. I, you know, talk to a lot of people when I'm, when I'm traveling. It's like, ah, you know, it's just, dude, just a, a normal guy, nothing special. We get off the ferry at the far end of this thing on the Argentine side and it's evening, it's, it's nighttime. So it's dark outside and we're all getting off the ferry. We're all kind of pushing through, looking for our, our taxi to take us wherever we're going or, or pick up a ride, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking I'm a badass, right? Like, oh, I just spent three months learning Spanish. I'm pretty good. I'm certainly not fluent, but I'm pretty good. Um, and I'd been mistaken for a local by some policeman when I got stopped in a car for doing something, not for speeding or something. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And I go to hail a cab and here comes this dumpy Midwestern dude who I talked to, who is, you know, seemed to be like a, yeah, just a dude you met in, I don't know, uh, where I went to high school, Indianapolis. Um, and he pushes by me, fluent in Spanish, um, hails a cab, he's in it and he's gone. And it changed in a moment my kind of understanding of how I was understanding the world. Like, oh, I made a, a giant mistake there writing that dude off as some, you know, joker businessman who has, who's out of his element. Like, he is way more in his element than I am. So, Lee and I get a cab get to our hotel it's i don't know nine or ten o'clock at night now and we're like oh we're both hungry so we go out to find a bite to eat and we're walking through these alleys of buenos aires it's super cool and we're getting hungry and hungry and as you know sometimes you get hungry you get pretty angry and it's just like dude the next place we find i'm going inside so we walk by this place it's fluorescent kind of ugly lighting looks like it's a, a a butcher shop or a meat counter walk inside no one else is in there it's all uh, uh what are like the plaid tablecloths or the checker tablecloths like kind of classic what you'd think of as like a steakhouse kind of cool place to eat there's no one inside there except for this one dude the guy in the ferry we sat down with him and he turned out to be one of the greatest storytellers i've ever met so he was one of the pilots that flew the pow's back when they were released at the end of end of vietnam so they um, he's assigned to the plane that is going to fly him home so they get from vietnam to hawaii they're in the hospital in hawaii for a while then they all load onto his plane and they're going to go back to the states for their kind of welcome home and he's the dude, he's the pilot in charge of him. So the Air Force had basically said to him, and this is not really how the military works, but it's close enough. You know, hey, you're assigned to these guys. Um, whenever they are ready to go, you're going to fly him back. So he gets these, whatever it was, 9, 10, 12 guys in his plane. Giant, uh, what is it, C-130, something like that. Giant cargo plane. And they're all coming back. And they're all pumped because they haven't been to, you know, mainland America in, in years and years. They've been in prisoner war camps. And as they're coming into um, San Francisco the area where they're going to land, you know, and touch down and there's going to be this whole like press thing for them and all these people are excited. Um, they are pumped in the back. They're as passengers. And so they start saying like, let me see it, let me see it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, get, you know, the co-pilot, like, get them up here. So they get a couple of these guys in and all they can fit in the cockpit is three or four dudes. And so these four guys are watching and they're watching mainland America come closer and they're seeing the Golden Gate Bridge. And, you know, this, this, yeah. 
they're seeing the Golden Gate Bridge, and one of the one of the former POWs is like, dude, you've got us on board. We're your golden ticket. Fly under the bridge. And he's, you know, he's thinking to himself, like, no, I, I couldn't do that. They're like, come on, fly under the bridge, dude. So he gets fired up and he's like, you know what? I've had a great career so far. This is gonna be awesome. It'll probably be the last time I fly, but this is gonna be a super fun thing to do. So brrr, the plane goes down, he goes under the golden bridge. Golden Gate Bridge, he's got, you know, with a giant cargo plane. These guys are all like screaming, hooting and hollering like they're back in America. They're, they're super, they're super psyched. And he, you know, he comes out and he's like, that was cool. Like now I'm going to go land. That was, this is the last flight of my life. And of course the dudes who are in the back who didn't get to do it, like, dude, what's happening? What's happening? The guys up in the cockpit, like, dude, you guys got to come up and do this. Like, come on, Cap, do it again, do it again. So they get in there and it ends up that it, it takes three runs to get all the prisoners to have a view of flying under the Golden Gate Bridge. And ATC, air traffic control, is like, hey, uh, you know, what, what would you say is going on out there? looks like you're a little bit delayed. He's like, ah, I got some, uh, you know, weather patterns, whatever it was. And he's just saying like, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy this. I will never fly a plane again. Like this is super hazardous. This is way outside of anything you can do. Never going to fly a plane again. So I'm going to enjoy this. So he's, you know, hooting and hollering, screaming with the rest of them, like doing awesome stuff. So they go through the third time, comes up, everybody sits down in the back and they're now they're all super psyched, super psyched. And he lands the plane. Lands the plane, and there, you know, there's the press and all the rest of the people. Like here, are the American prisoners coming home. Um, obviously, very different than what we have now, but still, everybody's pretty psyched to get these guys back. And he savors every minute of shutting the plane down, basically. So he's because he's like, I'm never doing this again. Like what I did was so outside the pale that I'm never gonna fly again. So he enjoys it. He gets off the plane, and he's just, you know, as he takes his last steps off, he's like, oh, this is super cool. And he goes out and he sees his boss there and his boss comes up and he's like, here it comes. He's like, hey dude, uh, great job. We got you back on the roster for tomorrow. So uh, yeah, just get a good night's sleep and you'll, you'll get back on there. <laughs> it's like this, you know, yeah, rad story. And he said something to me after that. So we went on and talked and he told me lots of other stories like that, that were just, you know, maybe not true, but in the moment they're so good. And he was such a good storyteller that you went with and you're like, yeah, I'm just going to enjoy the whole experience. But he told me something, he's a businessman. He's down there to buy a, like a string of hotels. And he told me something about business. This was when I was brand new. I was, I was like 23 or something. I don't think I, I hadn't started a business in my life before. And he gave me this piece of advice that has stuck with me to this day. So 20 years later. Um, and that I passed on to plenty of people. And that I want to pass on to you. Because it's important. It's an important part of being really in helium. Really in cryptocurrency. In, in the world right now. And he said, Nick. So the opportunity of a lifetime comes along once a week if you're looking for it. And that made such an impact on me that I've seen it happen in my life over and over. And whether that opportunity for you right now is helium or something else, it's this pretty radical idea that you can always change your life. You can always do something better. You can always find a new opportunity. There are always new and better and more radical ways to come along and they are mind-blowingly um, giant and they're always there once a week they're there all right let's talk about amateur jade hair let's talk about hot spots in helium if you want to come on board for this course I'll, uh, I'll drop the link in the bottom of this thing but i really want you to have a rad time in helium to understand it deeply and to for it to be one of many opportunities of a lifetime for you let's do this all right so this is me and tj up at the ajh site taking off the giant sector antenna and uh, yeah, getting off that thing. You can see we've already got the H antenna up. It's the little white thing uh, just to the top right of where TJ's pulling that thing off. You can see he's a beast. He's handling that thing like it's uh, made of tissue paper. It's 32 pounds, but pretty awkward. And here he throws it off the, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Puts it down and we go back and kind of fix everything else. Here it is when it's up. So you can see we replaced this giant antenna with a small one. Here the thing is in the back. And then, uh, yeah, then the rest of it was just a five or six mile hike out with the a giant load on my back. So this is kind of the most fun part of off grids for me. It might not be the most fun part for you, but there's certainly things we can learn about every single off grid and every single deployment that will be uh, useful to everyone. So here we are kind of hiking home, cruising down the trail. Uh, I got a little clip here of why I like San Diego. All right. So this is one of the reasons I love San Diego and deploying hotspots in San Diego is we got such great geography. You can see downtown way in the distance there. You can see Cowles Mountain. We got these rad little rugged trails 
Um, there's all kinds of super cool stuff to do here. I mean, San Diego is an awesome place and it happens to be one of the first places that hotspot deployments really did uh, super well and were kind of demonstrations of what a city could be covered with and how it could be covered well. It got a little bit overcrowded, I'll give you that. There's a lot of people here, but um, Jesus Christ, a super cool place. There we go. Super cool place to put a hotspot up. Maybe I'll keep that in, maybe I won't. <laughs> All right, that's it. There's me and TJ at the start and uh, me and TJ at the end of that particular deployment. But I've done all kinds of deployments. I've put them on office buildings. I've put them off grid with funky antennas. I've backpacked them in. I've worked with uh, teams to do this stuff. So showing people how to do it, you know, walking them through how they're going to do their own off-grid deployments. Obviously, I've put a bunch of my own off-grids up. I've worked, like I said, on buildings, put them on these giant poles um, on top of a ton of different commercial buildings and walking people through how to do their hotspots. Um, these are just a couple examples. I've gotten inside of these things. So if you have kind of any questions about doing your hotspot, whether it's on-grid or off-grid, however it looks, if you're connecting it to cable or to funky old stuff in your house, I can probably help you figure it out. I love doing this stuff, love helping people with it. I really look forward to working with you however we get to work together. Rock on.